Okay, I'd say let's get started. So uh, welcome everybody. This is the first uh, ECPR virtual method school. And this is uh, the first virtual uh, uh, luncheon event, which we are very used to holding uh, in, a, in a room with people being there and not very used to doing it this way. So, uh, so thank you very much for joining us uh, in this horrible experiment imposed upon us. And, uh, and I'm very happy to see that there are more participants than panelists. That's usually what we try to reach uh, at these events. So, uh, so welcome. And, uh, and uh, first of all, it's just uh, some, some uh, house cleaning uh, uh, matters. We have recording on. That is because at these events, we usually have a photographer, which uh, we couldn't figure out how to do. So, uh, so, uh, so we, we just, turned on recording and uh, hopefully that's what we're going to use in marketing materials in the future. So if you don't like to be seen, then turn off your camera and hide your name uh, and uh, uh, you can still participate. So, so, uh, so yeah, so the idea was to have an event about uh, this horrible thing that forced us online and that is COVID-19. Many people have seen this as a research opportunity turning uh, uh, horrible lemons into awesome lemonade. And uh, there are many people here who have actually done that already, uh, but we singled out Reka uh, Branitsky and Michael Beck Peterson to be on this panel. Uh, Reka is a, is a PhD student at Central European University and is a, a long time method, method school veteran, has been my teaching assistant at the method school already and also for many other classes. And uh, Michael Bang Peterson is, uh, is an old friend of mine who does very, very cool research on evolutionary psychology in uh, political science, something very close to my heart, and uh, has started an awesome project. He's from Aarhus University. He's a professor there. And, uh, and uh, I wanted to also introduce uh, just, just a few more people. So Kostas Gemenis is my collaborator on a project on COVID-19. We, uh, we, uh, we have submitted a proposal to the European Social Survey to look at the impact of conspiracy theories on the rule compliance in, in, in COVID-19. Mm -hmm. I don't want that to be front and center, but I wanted to mention it that I'm also dragged into this horrible research and he's directly responsible. He's the instructor for the quantitative text analysis course. Maru Wozanciano, who is, a, who is an instructor for, at, the, at the summer school, not here, also at the winter school in the past uh, for regression and multi-level models. He's also doing this kind of research. Michael Dorsch is, is, uh, is a CEU professor who's doing this kind of research with uh, one of the co-authors of Reka. He's a professor at uh, Central European University. So there are plenty of us, so this should be a lively discussion. And with this, I would like to hand over the floor to, to Reka. Thanks a lot for the intro, Levi. Hello, everyone. And I'm happy, Michael, that you are here. Uh, first, I thought that I, I would give my thoughts on the opportunities this horrible pandemic gave us as, as young researchers or as researchers in general. And then briefly, I will introduce the research that we did with Michael and, and Gabriel Cataluni, our other co-author. So one thing that, that we faced with this, with this pandemic is that this is an unprecedented thing. So this means that there is definitely a gap in the literature because this literature is not really existing yet. So this means that it's relatively easy to come up with original questions or maybe, maybe it's a better word to say unanswered. Maybe your question is not super original, but it's not answered because we haven't faced uh, such a pandemic yet. So that means that you, you might have some insights and valuable answers. Uh, yourself to this new thing. And it may be a bit also less intimidating to join an academic debate or conversation as a young researcher because we do not really have experts yet. So it's not that there, is, there are so many other people who know much more than you. It, it, it's all new for, uh, for all of us. So that's another point. And you may be thinking that I already have a research interest, some other research topic, why should I switch? But the truth is that I think this uh, pandemic is intercepting a lot of topics. So it's, for example, my case, I'm, I'm interested in aging societies, the employment and health of the elderly, 
if I just simply add COVID-19 to a potential dissertation <laughs> title, I am already ending up with a lot of new interesting questions. So the fact is that this pandemic really affects a lot of uh, spheres and, and um, most of our lives. So it's very easy to find a common ground with your already existing research interests and this new issue that or crisis that we are facing. So this is one thing that this is unprecedented. So it's easy to come up with questions. And the other thing is that this is interesting in, and relevant for all of us. And it is interesting in, and relevant right now. So I think it's a natural reaction to, to start research on it because probably you are reading and thinking about it anyway. So in the case you are not overwhelmed with it, so don't risk your mental health if you are super overwhelmed with this horrible pandemic. But if this is not the case and you are thinking about it anyway, then you, then you actually might consider to, to start doing research on it. And I think that these two factors, that this is something new, so it's easy to come up with questions and that it's also relevant and, and interesting for most of us. This adds up to, to a lot of pressure to be fast, to speed up, to, to try to, to come up with findings and, and analysis as fast as you can. So, and I think one, one part of it is that you would like to have an impact, you would like to help out, you would like to see your findings available for decision makers. But on the other hand, as an academic, you would also be, you would like to be among the first or the first uh, to publish a finding. So this adds up to this, to this pressure to not just start thinking about COVID and not just start the research, but, but do it relatively fast. And uh, my story was that uh, I was, uh, so now I'm a, I'm a mom of a two month old baby boy and I was pretty close to my due date when Michael Dorsch, my supervisor just asked like if, whether, whether I'm uh, free or available, do I, would I, if I would like to join uh, him and Gabriel in, in this research project. And I remember that, that my reaction was, ah, like, oh, this is great, it's super interesting, I've been waiting for this to work together, I'm really happy. But then I had this thought that, oh, but shit, actually I, I won't be able to contribute for a very long time because then I will have to quit at least for a while. And, and I told him that, oh, well, I'm afraid I'm not the best um, person to join because then I will have to, to quit. And then Michael told me, well, the idea is to actually get done by a paper, with a paper by, by a few weeks. So within the, these few weeks, we should be ready. And then I realized that, okay, this is something very different <laughs> than, I, than I was doing before. So this is not the usual pace of research that, that I am used to. So I was like, okay, so we are dropping everything. We are focusing on this project now. And, and the aim is to, to really speed the process up and, and get something out there. So I, I was very happy to be able to join. And I was also super impressed that actually we, we did it. So within a few weeks, I, I think we made a valuable sound analysis that was worth uh, spreading. So this, this, was, this was the, so it, it was impressive in, in the one hand, and I also felt a bit ashamed that, well, actually, I'm, I'm not that fast with, with my own dissertation. So it, it was a big learning lesson that actually, if you, if you drop things, if you focus on one, one project, then, then you can really uh, speed the process up. So all this said, I think I, I would also like to say that there are risks involved, of course. So it, there are a lot of questions that are unanswered and uh, that are interesting for most of us so it's relatively easy to to be heard but with all this extra speed and, and pressure i think these analysis are more prone to mistakes because you want to get it done fast so it's it's just adds uh, an extra probability to to do something that is, that is not exactly right this is one thing and and the other thing which which is a risk i think is that there is this trade off that you would like to be relevant and interesting today but what you do now which sounds great and relevant it may turn out to be totally irrelevant on the long run either either because some new information or data will overwrite your your findings which i think is fine so if i think if you can do a sound analysis with the data at hand at the moment 
then that, that's okay. So you don't have to worry a lot about being outdated, but, but this is still the case. So if you would like to see yourself uh, as a researcher who, who put something down there, which, which is for maybe not forever, but for a longer time or a longer term, you may face this risk that actually what we find uh, early on at, at this pandemic, it may not be true uh, later. So I thought that the, this trade, uh, trade off is, is worth mentioning. Uh, and another thing is that uh, this is still on the, on the plus side is that a lot of data so uh, are already available and actually this was uh, partly the reason why we could be so fast because, because others are also doing a lot of work uh, and they are collecting valuable data on policy responses on COVID deaths, testing and, uh, and so on and so forth. So as a young researcher, you, you can actually access these. You don't need to wait or spend a lot of time on your own, on your own field work or, or anything um, as such, but you can actually uh, reach uh, these data sources right away. And then uh, I don't know how much time I, I still have, but... Well, uh, not that much, but I think everybody's um, trying to find out what you found in your research and what yeah, you asked. Yeah, so this, this, is why, this is why I would like to uh, briefly uh, summarize our, our research and then Michael can help me out later on and we can, we can talk about it at, uh, at the Q&A session as well. So what we did with, with my co-authors, we, we tried to see how political regimes and, and death are related at the early stages of this pandemic. So we was uh, focusing on the first uh, 100 day. And our research question was whether more democratic uh, countries fare better in containing COVID-19. And our main outcome variable was actually death per capita in, in, in the country. And uh, we, we thought that there is anecdotal evidence on, on a democratic trade-off that there are civil liberties and our privacy and, and to protect this, this, this may uh, mean that we are not able to contain COVID as, uh, uh, as effectively as uh, more autocratic countries. So what we did was uh, to do a cross-sectional uh, cross-country analysis uh, where we, uh, what we found actually is, is that democratic countries were averse at containing COVID uh, early on. So our hypothesis or, or this anecdotal evidence was um, uh, seemed to be to be proven uh, based on our based on our data. And then what we also also uh, saw is that it's not just there are higher numbers, but but these incidences of, of COVID deaths, they appeared earlier on in more democratic countries. And what uh, we suspected as, as a part of the story is that these countries introduced less uh, stringent policies. So we also found uh, an association there that actually countries that are more democratic, they, they introduced less uh, stringent um, policy measures uh, to, to fight the spread of COVID, such as closing down schools, closing down workplaces, limiting uh, uh, mobility or testing and, and tracking people. And then finally, we also found that the policy responses, they were somehow less effective uh, in, in more democratic countries. So our findings were kind of unsettling because we are usually used uh, to find that democratic countries fare better in most of our performance indicators that we are interested in. But on the short run, what we found that early on, uh, these countries were not uh, as, as good uh, to contain and, uh, and avoid uh, death uh, due to, uh, to COVID. And one of our main uh, challenges was uh, the fact that actually may, it may be the case that less democratic countries are systematically under-reporting uh, COVID deaths or, or COVID cases. So we tried to, to overcome this issue by, by controlling for, for transparency, me uh, transparency measures to, to catch uh, this, uh, this underlying effect. And, and even, even with those uh, controls, uh, the, the association still remained. So our finding is, is basically that more democratic countries uh, fare worse early on containing COVID-19.
So in a nutshell, this was our uh, research and we can come back to it uh, later on. Thanks. Thank you. Michael? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Just a second, I'll, I'll share some, some slides. Um, all right. Um, uh, thank you also to uh, well. First of all, thank you for for providing me the opportunity to to uh, talk about this uh, research project. But also thank you very much to uh, Rika. That is, uh, uh, I, I very much agree with with your pros and cons, and it's a it's a fascinating study that um, that you have been doing. So the the research project that I'll be talking about is is uh, slightly uh, different in terms of the organization, uh, and I'll I'll get back to that uh, later uh, on. So it's uh, it's a project that uh, didn't initially have this sort of very tight hypothesis to be tested, but was envisioned from the beginning as a data collection uh, exercise. Um, but let me uh, let me start from the uh, beginning on on what it is that uh, we are interested in overall. So as as we all know, uh, an epidemic is a is a very special form uh, of uh, crisis, uh, and that also reflects uh, what Rika uh, was saying. That in in many uh, other uh, crises, uh, the government uh, politicians can basically tell uh, citizens to to keep calm and carry on, as was the British slogan uh, during the Second World War. But that is not the case in an uh, epidemic or a pandemic, because the uh, the actual problem is uh, at the level of uh, citizens, and therefore citizens need to change. Uh, behavior and the need to do so uh, very fast. The need to adopt uh, physical distancing. Uh, the need to adopt the use of facial masks and so on. So the the crucial question that we have been interested in from the beginning is well how how to flatten the curve basically how to motivate citizens to engage in that kind of uh, of behavior and. Um, it, Exactly as as Riga was uh, saying, then uh, there are different um, tools available to different political regimes. So uh, this is a uh, quote about the uh, the situation in Wuhan, where apparently police they the police welded doors shut uh, such that people couldn't enter and leave buildings. I'm unsure whether this is uh, in fact uh, true or whether it is uh, fake news, but at least it was reported that, uh, and I think it's undoubtedly true, that uh, very strict measures were taken in Wuhan in order to uh, enforce um, uh, physical distancing. Uh, in, in other countries, uh, a range of uh, less uh, severe uh, measures have been uh, used. So this is a map uh, using the uh, Oxford measure of stringency uh, that basically shows the level of, uh, of uh, severity that uh, have been used in order to impose uh, lockdowns in the different um, countries. So this is from the 30th of March, uh, but of course it looks different uh, now. But the basic questions is that in democracies, uh, you cannot use uh, force to the same extent as you can in non democracies. You need to make use of power uh, as, as Riga was also referring to. Uh, and that's because that there are both normative and practical limitations to the use of force in democracy. So first of all, you have the whole normative dimensions of, uh, I apologize for the dog, if you can hear that in the, in the background. Um, but uh, there's first the, all the uh, rights of citizens uh, that you need to uh, obviously take care of. But it's also, there are also practical limitations to the use of force because uh, the uh, pathogen avoidance behavior really uh, is difficult to monitor and enforce. It's a lot of private behaviors that are difficult to, um, yes, to monitor. So this means that uh, compliance will always, uh, especially in democracies, depend on citizens' discretion, which means that in a democracy, political leadership and communication is 
very important in order to uh, create the necessary compliance. So this is, this is basically the, the question that we uh, are trying to figure out in, in, in this research project, which is very much a broad question of how can you uh, lead uh, citizens through a crisis like this. So the project uh, is called the HOPE Project, How Democracies Cope with COVID-19. And it's uh, very much a, a data-driven uh, project. Um, the, so we are basically uh, going about this in an exploratory way, asking how democracies react and cope as this crisis unfolds and with what effects. Uh, and we're using the fact that this crisis happened, uh, happens uh, in the middle of the big data revolution. So there are unprecedented possibilities of documenting what is going on by combining surveys, uh, social media data, behavioral data, and epidemiological data. Uh, the, the basic uh, project is uh, very much a sort of multi-project. Uh, it's multidisciplinary. It's, uh, based on uh, like multi-methods and it's multi-institutional. So there are a number of different uh, Danish uh, universities uh, involved uh, and therefore also a number of uh, different uh, co-PIs. And we are using basically every method uh, from uh, uh, ethnographic methods. So we have had people out in different communities as, at hospitals in order to uh, document what is going on there. We're using uh, behavioral tracking, using um, uh, phone data. We are uh, scraping social media data, obviously. We are collecting uh, incredible amounts of survey data, which is uh, basically what I'm responsible for. So this, uh, this is in many ways a giant project and it was sponsored by, uh, by the Kasberg Foundation, which is, uh, so Carlsberg is a brewery, uh, which have, uh, for historical reasons, very close ties to the Danish uh, science community. Uh, and therefore they are funding research. Um, and they reached out to us very early in the, uh, in the crisis, in the, in the mid-March, uh, and asked uh, whether this group were able to spearhead a social science project, uh, which could basically uh, be oriented towards getting as much data uh, as early as possible in order to understand what is going on. And uh, the, the way we have constructed the, process, uh, the project is that it is in two phases. Uh, so there is a classical research uh, phase where we are publishing papers, business as usual, and so on. But that's the second phase. And now we are still in phase one, which is to uh, collect data uh, and also uh, sharing these findings with authorities. So a key part of the project is to feed data to health authorities uh, in Denmark, uh, both the, at the political level, but also at the, uh, at the, at the, at the level of the, the, the health authorities trying to model the epidemic and so forth. So a lot of my time now goes with uh, uh, talking to uh, political leaders, uh, the health authorities, and also talking to uh, a very large number of journalists uh, because uh, the, uh, the project uh, now has a significant uh, public uh, attention. So this is in many ways a very uh, different way of working than what I'm used to. Uh, and there are dilemmas to navigate that I'm not uh, used to, uh, both in terms of the, uh, the, uh, how quickly everything uh, needs to uh, go, but also in terms of uh, uh, juggling uh, the the, res the responsibility of uh, informing uh, authorities uh, on on how we see the current situation, um, and not only talking with authorities but also talking with uh, journalists, which which is an exercise uh, in itself. 
So uh, this is uh, this is the the uh, the basic setup of the of the project, and and overall, what we hope to really do uh, when we get to uh, phase two, the more sort of classical research phase, is to uh, understand what you can call the information flows uh, that happens during the uh, pandemic. So uh, we have uh, government decisions, we have media, we have citizens' behavior, and we have the epidemic in itself. And the sort of traditional political science model goes something like this, that the government uh, makes some kind of decisions, uh, decision that is covered by the media, uh, and that then influence uh, citizens, which then in this case will influence the uh, epidemic. So we are collecting data on all these different kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, nodes in the information flow. And will then establish this sort of very large number of time series. And then uh, we hopefully will be able to understand how these relate. Uh, and uh, there, I'm happy that we have a, uh, a person from physics uh, involved who is an expert in crunching these huge uh, amounts of data because it is really huge amounts of data that we are uh, dealing with right now. I think we have surveyed over, over one, uh, 100,000 uh, individuals um, already, and we are continuing. So, but of course, what we are thinking is that this traditional model of the information flows doesn't really uh, work out in, in this neat way. So it's basically trying to figure out how are all these different levels uh, influencing each other? How is the epidemic in itself influencing citizens' behaviors? How is, uh, citizens' behaviors being picked up by the media, uh, covering lack of physical distancing, lack of uh, mask use, and so forth. Uh, and how is there perhaps in this situation a closer relationship between government decisions and citizens' behaviors than there is normally because citizens, at least in Denmark, have been paying huge amount of, uh, of uh, attention to press conferences uh, and so forth. So. We expect that the that the sort of normal need model of the information flows uh, will look very different in this uh, situation and think of this as a uh, unique opportunity to explore this. And just sort of as, as one example that we hope to be able to, to dig deeper into is um, the fact that there's kind of a puzzling uh, pattern of data. So what we have been doing uh, is that we are collecting data uh, on uh, self-reported compliance with health advice in eight uh, democracies. So Denmark, Sweden, Germany, France, Italy, United Kingdom, Hungary, and United States using surveys. And what you can see in this figure, the, the solid line is the self-reported level of compliance with health advice from a scale from zero to one. Then you have the dashed lines, which are these stringency measures. So basically the, the severity of the lockdowns. And then you have the number of cases, which are the red bars. And what, what is a, to us, very interesting feature is that everywhere we see very high levels of uh, self-reported uh, compliance with health advice, independently of the severity of the epidemic, independently of the severity of the lockdowns. So this suggests to us that there's something different going on uh, in this pandemic than what has been going on before. And one of the hypotheses that we uh, hope to be uh, testing is that perhaps two things have been spreading uh, in this uh, pandemic. One thing is obviously the virus that has been spreading uh, globally very fast. But perhaps another thing has been uh, spreading even faster namely the idea of uh, physical distancing. And perhaps this means that a lot of countries have already complied with uh, the basic advice of uh, distancing yourself from others uh, when the pandemic hit. So maybe we are seeing, and this is completely a conjecture at, at this point, but maybe we are seeing the first example of a, a global public sphere uh, where people uh, across the, uh, the, the world are discussing how to uh, solve the problem that we are facing.
that's at least sort of one optimistic uh, possibility in the midst of uh, this uh, terrible uh, pandemic. And with that, I want to say thank you very much for your uh, attention. And I'm happy to uh, answer questions both about the uh, sort of content about the project, but also the whole uh, organization and so forth. Thank, thank you. And uh, what we want to do is to open it up uh, to questions now. Uh, but Michael, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something while you just stopped the screen sharing, but maybe we could put it back. Can you show us the website and the interactive data part of the website? Because that is really, really cool. And I, I really yep. hope people can see it. And in the meantime, I'm going to abuse my uh, role as a chair and, and kick, off, uh, kick off with the first question. To, uh, I'm going to ask Jacob one. So what, one of the things I was wondering as you were presenting this is, is let's take your typical authoritarian country. I think the number of flights into Minsk is probably a dozen a day, whereas the number of flights into Milan is probably in the hundreds over multiple airports. Um, could this be one of the reasons why authoritarian regimes were, were less hit because nobody goes there and, mm -hmm. and, and we, are, we were actually also thinking about this. So, so what we what we could do is that we controlled for a number of airports in the country to trying to yeah to account for for this difference. And uh, the results seem to be to be the same. So they still hold. This may not be the best control, uh, but but this is what what we could come up with. But if you have if you have another idea how to how to capture these differences, then, then let us know. No, I mean, number of person travel. I mean, no, but that's great. That's I actually like the paper, <laughs> so I know you've done this. So, uh, Michael, do do you happen yep. to? Have I have the, the I have the website. Uh... So you should be able to see our website uh, right now. And and basically, one of the one of the challenges, or one of the uh, ideas with with this project is to communicate uh, both with the scientific community, with the authorities, and with journalists and with citizens. So we are trying to put up as much uh, as possible on our uh, website. So here we have. Uh, some of it is in English, some of it is in uh, Danish, but we are basically all the reports that we are sending to the uh, to the government and to the national uh, health authorities are put here online such that journalists and citizens can uh, look at it as well. Um, here we have uh, reports on some of the data that we are sharing with the health authorities to help them predict the uh, epidemic uh, better. Uh, then we have uh, sort of small little stories here about particular uh, topics uh, that uh, we have sent to the uh, media. But we also have an interactive component here with the dashboard, which uh, you can go and, and explore yourself, where we are basically plotting some of uh, the data uh, about health compliance, uh, feelings related to the uh, pandemic, uh, evaluations of the government response. And you can, you can see this for, for all the countries that we are collecting data in, uh, which I mentioned uh, before. So uh, if you are living in Hungary or if you're living in the United States, there should be something uh, interesting uh, for uh, all of you. Thank you, thank you. And all right, so I, I think we should open it up. So uh, um, do you have, um, do you have, um, you can use the hands function if you have a question uh, to anybody and uh, stop stepping over your son. Jan, good to see you. Hi, uh, hi. Uh, so thanks for your very interesting uh, talks. Uh, I didn't find the hand, that's why I put it just in the, in the comment section already, but uh, just thinking about this airport situation. So if we just took the numbers of airports that would introduce a bias for larger countries, of course, because they might have more airports just because of their size. So going with the number of plane departures and arrivals or the number of airborne travelers would maybe be a better idea, but think about it like about these different 
things because it's about the movements of individuals in the end, not just the airports. So that might be a thing. Um, but I also wanted to ask a more general question um, about what uh, Reka said before um, when it was about um, how we adjust our research right now uh, because of COVID. Uh, I had the feeling with a lot of conversations with colleagues that there, there now many people try to just construct some kind of COVID thing in their research. And I have some, some problems with that, uh, just of my understanding of research and how research should be conducted ethically, um, that we now just like try to push it in our agendas anyway, just to get the money and the funding uh, that is now currently available for projects that we would otherwise want to do. So what would your thoughts uh, be on this? I understand this concern and I also have sometimes the feeling that, oh, not again, another COVID paper, just, just for the sake of it. But, but then, so I think if, if personally, if you feel like this, then you definitely shouldn't, shouldn't do it. But then if you, if you think that you really have something interesting to say, which is actually relevant. So it's, it's not, I don't think it's necessarily a, a bad thing to, to try to, to join this conversation, which is interesting and relevant right now for most of us. So this may be a, a bit of a wishy-washy answer, but, but I, I think it's, it's really, in the end, it's, it's your personal feeling about it. Yeah, and if, if, I, can, uh, if I can add uh, to that, I, I think it's uh, like the same criteria that uh, operates for research under normal circumstances also uh, operates here uh, like it it obviously needs to have a uh, a contribution uh, like you need to be able to justify the contribution and if you can do that then i i think that you should go for it if you if you think if if you cannot do that then obviously you shouldn't but i think it's it's worthwhile thinking about whether uh the pandemic provides a uh, provides an opportunity to test particular features of the theoretical framework that you are working with. Uh, that might be one, one way to sort of say, uh, my favorite topic and uh, COVID. Um, but, but also, I'm, I'm certainly not thinking that everyone should drop everything they're doing and, and only do research on, uh, on, on uh, COVID. Myself, I, this, this is actually a little bit different than what I normally uh, do, uh, but I, I felt that I, 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 couldn't, uh, I, couldn't say, I couldn't say no uh, in, in the sense that uh, this seemed important and somebody needed to do it. Uh, and apparently that uh, job now uh, fell to me. Uh, Michael, are are there any ethics considerations that have caused dilemmas in the project? Uh, not uh, not so much. Uh, you could you could say that uh, one of the uh, things is that well that well there are bro broadly speaking there are uh, ethical considerations that that uh, have uh, caused uh, headaches. Um, one, one is, of course, the ethics of data collection, uh, where uh, I think some of what we have been doing would have been uh, more difficult if we lived in the United States and needed to uh, wait for IRB for survey research. So that is uh, not uh, like the national policies in Denmark is that you don't need IRB approval uh, for uh, conducting survey research, for example. Uh, but in addition to this, there, there are the, the whole ethical issue related to open science in, in the sense like how, how to navigate the fact that you are uh, providing information to the government, uh, but you also need to be open about what it is that you are, are sharing. And, and the, the way we sort of uh, have, have solved that dilemma is... Uh, 
by being uh, completely uh, open in terms of what we feed into the political system. I am looking for hands, hands with questions. Come on, come on, come on. You. Stop stepping over each other. Someone's gonna get hurt. So Michael? You. Michael Dorsch, do yeah. you have your? Uh, yeah, thanks. I can't find this hand function either. I don't know where, how, how, could somebody tell us how to do it? Where's, we're supposed to, supposed to be a, Method school or something. I don't know. I gotta figure this out before next week, I guess. Anyway, Levy, um, uh, you 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 kind of teased us with 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 um, with uh, information about your European Social Survey uh, module. Do you can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes. Let me let me let me start uh, with uh, just a personal story. So I uh, I have uh, received two papers early on. One was uh, Brekos and yours, and the other was Manu Bozanchanu on COVID, uh, asking for some feedback. And uh, and I was holding my head saying, "There's no way I'm jumping on this bandwagon. This is like I, I, I'll like this is just horrible. This is just a fab, and I don't ever want to do this." Uh, uh, when uh, when Bostas, uh, who is right here, has come to me with, uh, with, we should do COVID conspiracies. And it's something that both of us are interested in, conspiracy theories. So, so I literally spent 24 hours just trying to force that into a research framework uh, with Kostas. And, and, uh, and I'm going to let him take over because he was kind of the, the, the person behind it. And maybe I'll add something later. Kostas, you want to say something about the project? Very um, w well, yes. I mean, uh, that started. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just want to second uh, Levi's thoughts on uh, you know not wanting to you know get on the bandwagon. But then you know I, I've been interested uh, in conspiracy theories for some time, and um, yes, I mean it, this was like too good of an opportunity to pass, especially as um, you know. Uh, um, uh, several countries began um, uh, implementing lockdowns and all these conspiracy theories appeared, you know, very forcefully in the, the social media. And I thought, well, you know, maybe, you know, we should start uh, with, with some service and so on. And then there was like this uh, ESS call for, um, uh, for COVID-19 uh, um, specific questions. And then I had to reach out to Levy and say like, look, you know, I mean, um, this is probably too good of an opportunity to pass uh, if we really want to to look into conspiracy theories this this, this is this is a pretty good moment um, and you know hopefully uh, this this is going to be a project which will um, uh, hopefully outlive uh, COVID-19 and we will be able to uh, also look at other things like uh, climate change which is also something we're, we're both uh, interested in and which has like a very um, um, uh, also important aspect with uh, with uh, climate uh, conspiracy theories as well. So uh, yes, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I you know I I don't like to say that you know a pandemic brings uh, opportunities because if you look at you know uh, all sorts of uh, pandemics with with perhaps lesser known viruses, um, we 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 see the, the same pattern being repeated. We have conspiracy theories uh, coming up. So. Uh, yes, I mean, if, if if we're going to do something about uh, some research about it, probably this is this is the best opportunity. The, so. the re yeah, thank you. So the the call was basically give us five questions to put on the ESS. So that was the call, and justify it. Uh, the the uh, the questions we proposed is uh, very much in line with Michael's project. So rule compliance. And uh, we were thinking that at the time of the data collection, which is expected early next year, uh, that would you get vaccinated is probably the best thing that most uniformly is applicable. We have uh, general conspiracy 
thinking and uh, and the COVID conspiracy thinking in uh, in the in the project. Um, trust in scientists is is one of the items, and also also there are multiple items on on like kind of ideological background. And uh, what we're hoping to do is is to look at how conspiratorial thinking is impacting rule compliance. And we think that we will be able to do this both for COVID and climate change with the data that's coming out of the ESS. So that's that that was the proposal, and and um, and we got lucky. So uh, we have some questions, Alexander. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, sorry, I have some problems with my camera. I don't know, now it's working. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for all these uh, valuable input uh, and also for the ideas on uh, which projects can be useful uh, in order to be better with the pandemic and also to see which countries maybe might be better off. Um, but what I also what I also hope to hear a little bit about when I was uh, registering for this uh, event is um, not only about interesting projects about COVID, but also um, good strategies to deal with the implications which COVID has for existing projects. So for example, in my project was heavily based on interviews and excellent interviews, and I wanted to meet people and see what they are thinking about uh, my research objects on how my how my research is influencing their work and this is obviously not not possible anymore and i found a creative phase so I'll, I'll now look on existing data sets and look how what they can be how can how they can be useful to me and i would like to hear maybe a similar stories about different about other research projects which uh were yeah basically experiencing setbacks through the, through the pandemic and then found creative ways around that. So, Alexander, I'm, I'm going to encourage everybody not to answer your question because okay. next, next, next week's event, uh, huh. at the same time, at the same place, is uh, going to be exactly on this topic. And one of the speakers is Manu Bozanchanu, who's here. So maybe you want to do a three-sentence teaser so we don't leave with, without a complete answer, but maybe he's going to be one of the panelists. Um, thanks a lot, Levy, and thanks, Alex, for your for your question. I think for sure there are there are um, a range of of research designs that would be normally applicable in any in any context that have been disrupted. Um, field experiments is probably one of them. Anything that has to do with intergroup contact, which would involve extended periods of interactions between people of different ethnicities. Something those have also would have been uh, would have been um, disrupted. Um, we have currently a project in Uganda which would we were no longer able to do in the original way that we had envisioned because of the same the same reasons. Um, it's it's difficult for me to give a precise um, sort of set of steps that could be could be done to to tackle something like this, given the fact that there are so many differences between an experimental project, one that involves um, interviews with policymakers, one that involves, um, you know, sort of collective, collective interactions to, to assess something. I think you're absolutely right that it does take a little bit of creativity. Um, perhaps one way to tackle something like this is to focus on um, trying to, for example, for a dissertation project, trying to come up with a chapter that might capture things from a historical perspective or focusing more in depth on, um, on a strategy that would no longer involve direct interaction with people. Um, I, I think maybe we haven't heard your project and what, uh, what the goal of, that, of those interviews would be, but maybe a way would be to pivot to a, to a sort of a um, virtual interview or virtual forum type of, type of format, um, or, you know, the different strategies that, that could be of help of this, but, but for sure there are um, 
there is a need to kind of think flexibly about what could be achieved in this context. And if, if the current format doesn't work and nothing clearly can be replaced, then shifting to, to maybe a chapter that is more using, you know, using historical data or doing analysis on records or something like this, something that could be done without a great deal of interpersonal um, interaction. <laughs> Uh, so, but but more more details on this, as Levy said, next week. Uh, hopefully, the examples that that I have in mind would be able to to give you some ideas. And the other person on that panel is Boyana Lope, who is uh, who is teaching the virtual ethnography class. So, I think that's uh, definitely. Uh, so I see hands. So Jan. Yeah, thanks for the floor again. Uh, I thought I'd take the chance. Uh, this question goes to Michael Peterson and your project. Uh, so uh, when we heard about the conspiracy theories, an idea that came up uh, or a question that came up again was uh, about media reporting. So do you evaluate also how the media reports on those conspiracy theories sometimes because there have been some reports on this and also um, regarding the question whether democracies or autocracies are more efficient in fighting COVID. Um, do you also evaluate which countries are taken as positive examples? Because when I just heard that autocracies are more effective, then I was thinking, okay, but in the media, at least in the German media, those, um, those countries selected for reporting as positive were Japan, South Korea, um, and the like. So that does not sound like an autocratic uh, state being effective to me. So maybe there's a difference. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. And we, we are certainly looking at the, at the dimension of uh, conspiracy theories and, and mis, misinformation because both my, my regular research is uh, about that uh, exactly. And, and also one of the other co-PIs on the project is doing a lot of research on misinformation. So we are, we are very much interested in the role of misinformation in the whole process because I think that is one of the, 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 the key features of a democratic society is that there is a relatively free uh, flow of information but that also then involves the possibilities of, of misinformation. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we will be looking into is it's not just the amount of misinformation and how that uh, potentially shapes uh, compliance, but also uh, who are sharing uh, misinformation. Uh, and, and this is an example of, of how we are also using existing data infrastructures because we have sort of an, a, a panel of Twitter users that we regularly survey uh, American Twitter users and have uh, therefore also uh, uh, asked a lot of COVID questions uh, or posed a lot of COVID questions to them. So there we can link those answers to uh, sharing of uh, conspiracy theories uh, directly on, on Twitter, for example. So, so that is, uh, I, th I think it's a, a crucial part of, of understanding the information flows uh, in, uh, in democracies. So we'll be looking into that. And I see two more hands. So we have Christian and Magdalena. We got about five minutes. So uh, you want to shoot out the questions and then maybe we can deal with them together. We shouldn't go too much over because, uh, because uh, we like schedules and also there are classes starting at two. So, so um, Christian. Okay, so I had a brief comment on the on the conspiracy things, but we maybe I'll take it up with you, Levy, personally, more on the political dimension of things. There are a lot of people, you know, saying that these um, restrictions for travel are nowadays political, and I find that very interesting to kind of have a follow up on. And uh, the question probably is, you know, um, do you uh, do you all, all or do you guys have any idea how kind of European political science is faring as compared to, I don't know, American political science and kind of doing research on COVID-19 or is there like a gap or some, some sorts or, you know, anything about European political science and COVID-19? And Magdalena, let's, let's get the questions out. Yes, hi. Sorry, I don't have a camera, so you will have to 
to just listen to me. Um, my question is to, to Michael's uh, hypothesis about the emergence of a global sphere, global public sphere, um, in terms of COVID-19 measures you were referencing or referring to a physical distancing. And I think I, I would agree that this is probably the global consensus that this is uh, um, valid for, for most countries. But then again, I'm wondering how to deal with different individual countries and um, political and scientific consensuses that differ from one another. For example, uh, I live in the Netherlands, and, but I'm German. So there is a rather different approach in the Netherlands when it comes to mouth protection, for example. So what is true in Germany uh, and, and solidary is not true in the Netherlands currently. So I fear that actually there might be different spheres emerging as well. Actually, you want to take this first? Yeah, uh, so I, I, I think you are absolutely uh, right, Magdalena, and I think it's it is very, very interesting to see the differences uh, that uh, is when it comes to facial masks on the one hand and, and physical distancing on the other. Um, when, when we have analyzed uh, compliance to physical distancing in, a, uh, in, in these eight different countries, we see very, very little uh, polarization regarding it. Uh, People everywhere uh, do it uh, independently of their partisanship, independently of uh, their trust in government and so forth. But uh, masks, for example, are different. Uh, and I think that there are some important psychological research also to be done on, on figuring out why, why is it that, uh, that the masks generate so much more uh, discussion uh, than than the um, than the physical distancing is it just the is it a matter of the scientific evidence is it a matter of uh, the feeling of a larger personal infringement uh, so to speak from masks or, or what is what is going on and I don't think we have a clear answer to that but I, I think you're right that that things are different when it comes to masks. Um, on, on the question about whether uh, how uh, European uh, political scientists are doing, uh, I'm I'm actually not sure, but I'm uh, I'm very interested in uh, in in hearing uh, other people's uh, thoughts on it. I'm I'm not sure either. Does anybody else have some thoughts on this? And it feels like there's plenty of European funds available because they threw the rest of the Horizon 2020 leftovers at this problem. So in this sense, I think the funding was, was, was available. And I mean, your project obviously shows that, that funding organizations jumped on board. I, don't, I haven't seen such uh, wide funding opportunities in the US sphere, but maybe I'm, not, I'm just not looking anymore. So maybe we're doing a little bit better than usual. <laughs> So, so, uh, so that's good. Um, in terms of travel restrictions and conspiracies, I mean, I, I, I don't know, like conspiracies come in many forms and we're not gonna have the opportunity with our project to explore many of it. Uh, I, I'm personally convinced that travel restrictions are political in the sense that, that I think Viktor Orban really has one chance of getting reelected next time. And that is uh, if he can claim victory over COVID. And so far he's doing very, very well. I don't know if it's luck or actual policies, but, uh, but uh, I think his stringent travel restrictions going against the EU on this is, is, is just going to be another communication tactic will come election time. So in this sense, I think there is, there is politics in the, in the travel restrictions. Uh, I think the World Health Organization just today issued a statement or yesterday that, that they don't believe travel restrictions is a good thing. Uh, that's not how we fight this. Uh, or border closures, I think, was, was the headline, but I haven't read the article, so. All right, uh, well, thank you very much for joining. I hope this was uh, enjoyable. It didn't feel much different than the in-person events, so I'm very happy for that. And I really, really would like to thank uh, um, 
everybody who, who said something and joined us and came. And uh, maybe down the road, we can convince Michael to become an instructor as well. Uh, so, uh, so I'm just putting that seed in your seed out there just so that it can grow. Uh, I know he would be an ex extremely awesome experimental professor. So, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for joining. And uh, next week, we're going to have one of these. And in two weeks, we're going to have one of these as well. The next week is going to be on the topic that Alexander was already asking about, is how to cope with this as a researcher and, uh, and the disruptions it causes as a researcher. And then we're going to have some more off non-COVID topic two weeks from now. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye.